Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of James, that's where our lesson is going to come from this morning. The book of James, chapter 1. I was here a couple months ago. It's been a while. I didn't come in August. I've gotten used to coming every month. We took uh, an extended time away in August for work, and then we coupled that with some personal travel. So I uh, haven't been here since July, uh, but it's so good to be back. I saw on, yeah, so I saw on the board there the welcoming for Michael A. Lopp in October, and so I guess he's coming. That is so awesome. I'm so excited for him to come here and start his ministry, um, and it has been such a pleasure over the past several months getting to know all of you and being able to come here and preach and maybe there will be opportunity for that in the future maybe not that's okay um i am so excited for michael to get here and get started very excited for the congregation here and for the work that he will do um the last time i was here we looked at the book of james and considered the introduction sort of a sort of an introductory lesson to the book of james In chapter 1, verse 1, he identifies himself, James, as the writer. And so we talked about who was James anyway. Uh, We identified he was probably the the brother of Jesus. Mary and Joseph had other children, and he was probably their brother. And he was also a leader of the church in Jerusalem. There's this James that comes on the scene at about Acts chapter 12 and 15. Very likely the same James that wrote this book. We talked about who he wrote to in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. And we talked about that 12 tribes is an Old Testament reference to the nation of Israel. Uh, This is for sure a Jewish audience. We saw all of the references to the Old Testament. Uh, And so this is for sure a Jewish audience, but they were Jewish Christians. And you could see that in, uh, for example, he calls Jesus Lord in several instances. He understands that his readers have faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord. That's seen in in chapter 2, verse 1. So he's writing to Jewish Christians, and it says, who are dispersed abroad. And we understood that dispersion, that scattering, is a reference to what happened after Stephen was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7 because he was preaching Christ, and people killed him for it. And there was a very um, serious persecution of Christians that was happening. They were fleeing the area. They were being thrown in jail. People, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, an apostle, was put to death by the sword. This James was eventually stoned because of his preaching Christ and himself being a Christian. It was serious times. And what that did was it provided uh, an idea for the historical context. So we talked about the historical context of James. Uh, Poverty was a big issue. There were famines, so natural disasters, and then also persecution for the cause of Christ was the big one. The big thing that we talked about, we went through verses two through four, which talked about trials. The irony that we discussed was the fact that he's writing to these people in the midst of serious persecution for the cause of Christ, serious trials that they were dealing with. And in verses two through four, he starts off his letter by saying, consider it joy when you encounter various trials. Kind of an ironic thing to write, and we talked about two things, really. There is a joy to consider in trials. There is a joy, and that joy is God expects us to approach trials with patience, and in so doing, it matures us spiritually. That is the idea behind verse 4, where it says, let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete. Perfection, completion in that sense is spiritual maturity, being able to withstand and be steadfast and endure in difficult times. We don't learn patience unless we practice it. We don't get opportunity to practice it unless it's tested. This is the idea. And then the second point was patient endurance does find favor with God. God expects us to respond with patience. That's implied from this passage in James, and we looked at other scripture to support that. I want to continue now and pick up where our scripture reading was this morning in verse 5. He continues, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, the first question is this. How is prayer for wisdom, 
in verse 5 connected to what James had to say in the first four verses? How is it relevant to the discussion of trials? The key is to associate this wisdom that James is telling us to pray for, associate that wisdom with patient endurance of trials. There's an association there. And the, the word that connects the two is lack, right? At least in the New American Standard Bible, you may have a different word. But for, in my Bible, it's the word lack. Because what he says in verse 4 is the end result of practicing patience, the end result of endurance is perfection and completion. And in so doing, you will not lack in anything. But you won't lack in anything is the end result of patience. But if any of you lacks, and you sort of expect him to say patience, right? It's like... The end result of patience is you don't lack anything. But if you do lack patience, but he doesn't say that. He says, but if you lack wisdom. And on some level, that connects the two in what he's talking about. There's a connection between this wisdom and patience. And you can think to yourself, how would a wise person respond to trials? At least one who is wise with the wisdom of God. How would they respond to trials? And what we understand from our discussion last time is I need to go to the next slide. We're connecting these two thoughts here. The idea from last time is that the wisdom that comes down from above, which James will talk about in chapter three, is one that endures patiently. That's why they are connected. Patient endurance is consistent with godly wisdom. And so by telling us, instructing us to pray for wisdom, it comes with it an understanding. It's an understanding. This wisdom is an understanding that patience is the way that I ought to approach these trials. And the key thing to recognize is that's not easy to agree with, right? We can, we can recognize that I should, as a Christian, approach trials with patience, but that's not always easy to recognize in the heat of the moment, right? And that is why we go to God with prayer, strengthen me, Equip me with this awareness when I need it the most. Because we need that strength, and it's easy to recognize that whenever things are, you know, like this morning, in a comfortable building, not exactly being insulted right this instant, for example, not having my philosophy and my theology tested immediately and ridiculed and scoffed at. But in the heat of the moment, to approach those situations and those people with patience, God give me the wisdom to be able to do that. An association is also permitted by looking at Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. There Paul says, We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. So in proclaiming Christ, they teach all men wisdom. And then he says, so that, what's the result of that, Paul? So that we may present every man complete in Christ. To be presented complete in Christ, what's the prerequisite for that? To be taught and admonished in wisdom. That's the association. That's the idea here. Pray for wisdom in order to um, give ourselves this awareness when we need it. Now, one thing to note is notice how prayer is not suggested to be used. Sort of the naive, maybe worldly approach to use of prayer when we find ourselves in difficult times is to use it like a magic wand. To pray that all our problems just disappear and immediately go away. What's ironic is he almost approaches prayer in a, in a different respect. It, this prayer for wisdom means this. I understand trials are going to happen. I understand they're going to happen because I'm a Christian. So God, give me the wisdom to approach them in the right way. It comes first with that understanding that trials will happen. In fact, the thesis that James suggests here is they're necessary to mature ourselves spiritually. So I just wanted to make that point that what is consistent with, with wisdom is to recognize you know, this use of prayer in the appropriate way. And what's interesting, what James will talk about when he refers to prayer in chapter 4, is he addresses his readership in chapter 4 and verse 3, saying, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives to spend it on your pleasures. That's an abuse of prayer. And Jesus, right, that's an abuse of prayer, using prayer in a way that it was not intended to be used. And James is giving us the direction 
by inspiration of God, how to effectively use prayer. Equip me with this wisdom. Now then, James continues and introduces the idea that the utility of prayer is conditioned on the faith of the one who's praying. So he reads, he continues in verse 6 saying, but he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Here, James describes a person, this person making the prayer, and he describes them in several different ways. There's several different characteristics that we could pull out. The one that I want to focus on this morning, for this morning's lesson, is the double-mindedness. I want to talk about the two minds this morning. And an interesting study that you could do on your own in James is to pull out these concepts of two. There are often these two things that are being contrasted or compared. There's, you could call it dichotomies in James. For example, at the end of chapter 3, he'll compare two wisdoms. you got the wisdom which comes from above, chapter 3, verse 17, and the wisdom which does not come from above. It's earthly, natural, and demonic in verse 14. He talks about two faiths in the second half of chapter 2. You've got the faith that uh, results in works, and you've got one who has faith with no works. It doesn't manifest in action. He talks about two births in chapter 1, verses 12 through 18. He says that uh, where sin is birth, he talks about the birth of sin, where that comes from. It starts, it's conceived with lust within us, and its end result is death. And then he talks about another birth, one that comes from God. Brought, God has brought us forth, uh, it says in, in verse, 18, verse 18, by the word of truth, so that we, be, we would be a kind of first fruit. So there's these two, it's a common theme in James, wisdom, faith, two births. Here, I want to talk about the two minds this morning. So the first thing to notice, it's two. Notice for a minute, he said double-minded. Could he have said multi-minded? He didn't say multi-minded. He didn't say triple-minded or quadruple-minded. He said two, double-minded. And the point there is it's a classic dichotomy in the Bible. Because we could say, well, where could our minds be centered? It could be centered on God, on money, on uh, pride, on fame on revenge but you see i just mentioned five things really it's two it's god and then everything else it's double-minded in that sense and so it suffices it's enough to say two minds because that covers everything it's a classic dichotomy in the bible so the question for this morning what are these two minds am i double-minded and I want to give some serious thought to this because what James is suggesting is this person in verse 7 ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. So we want to protect against it. Let's consider this morning what are the two minds. Two characteristics I want to pull out first. Doubting and instability. So in verse 6, you see um, this person, is, he says he must ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Now, considering the context, what is to doubt? What could James be talking about? In the context, what is to doubt? He has just talked about uh, there are trials that you can expect. Res consider them joyous. Respond to them in patience. If you lack anything, ask God for wisdom. And we talked about what he meant by that. So what is to doubt? One thing is to doubt that God will answer that prayer, to doubt that he's able, right? James says in verse 5, God gives to all generously and without reproach. Do we doubt that he is able to deliver on our request for wisdom? Maybe it's doubting that this is the right way to handle trials. Kind of an ironic instruction that James has given us, respond in patience. Do the thing that you wouldn't naturally want to do. Someone insults you, don't retaliate, don't talk back. Respond in love and in patience. And you might doubt that instruction. Is that really the way I ought to handle it? Ought we to combat worldly ideas that are, that are incompatible with, with our Christian ideas? Ought, should we uh, approach that with militant violence? No, no, no. That's not the Christian way. And so that, although that might be human tendency. That might be human tendency. 
And so we have a tendency to disagree with the instruction God gives us. In that sense, maybe we doubt the instruction He's giving us. Maybe we doubt that we can endure. James said, endure with patience. Maybe we doubt that we have that capacity. I'm so poor at this, I will never get better. I'll never be able to, to be resilient and calm in those storms of conflict. Maybe he's talking about that kind of doubt. Maybe it's doubting our faith altogether. You think about, for these people, enduring trials, what's the easiest way to avoid the persecution? Remember, Christianity is how old here? Maybe 20 years? Not that old. Many of these people were alive before Christ was resurrected from the dead. And they might think, oh, I could just go back to the way life was if I would just denounce my faith. So maybe they begin to doubt their faith altogether because they want to avoid this, this persecution. Ultimately, the will to persevere is a faith matter. And that's why at the end of this book, in chapter 5, verse 7, he will encourage his readers, wait patiently for the coming of the Lord. And he gives examples from the prophets from the Old Testament like Job. Uh, faith has... James had a lot more to say about faith. He devotes a big chunk of chapter 2 to that. It's really important. But whatever the exact reason, doubting is a problem for this double-minded man, for this double-minded person. He's conflicted between two minds, two schools of thought. Am I going to be devoted to God or not? I can't fully commit. That's the problem for this double-minded person. It ultimately results in commitment issues. Now for this second point. Instability. It says at the end of verse 6, this person is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And then in verse 8, it says being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So it's likened to the surf of the sea in verse 6, driven and tossed by the sea. We're pushed this way. They're pushed that way. It's like wherever the current influence is, it, wherever the current influence is, I am readily taken there. Right? If, if I am at church on Sunday morning and what the preacher has to say draws me toward that type of mindset, then great, I'll go this way. But then during the week, if some other impulse pushes me this way, then I'll readily go this way. It's like their mind is so ungrounded, it is readily taken wherever the current influence is. Just like water in an ocean. The wind blows this way and it goes. It blows the other way and it goes. This person is undecided. They're aware of two worldviews, but they're not convinced one way or the other. You might say that they're lukewarm, which is reminiscent of the criticism that was given to the church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. Then the criticism there says, I know your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. It's an undecided person. Can't make up their mind. That type of conviction will always crumble in the face of adversity. And you can imagine how this might underlie the doubtful prayer as well. Right? It's like this person who sometimes has a mind for God, and so because of that, they use prayer. They go to God in prayer but they're not committed, and so they have this doubt that creeps up in their mind, and in that sense, what they say with their mouths in the prayer is actually fake and insincere. Because in their heart, they say it, but they don't really mean it. Right? They use prayer. I'm a godly person. I use prayer, but I don't really mean what I'm saying. I just kind of hope and wish that it, that it comes true. It's not, it's not uh, backed up by a, a, a sincere and genuine commitment. That's the instability here. And you contrast that with how God wants us to be. He wants us grounded. Our minds sit in one place that doesn't change depending on the situation. Paul had some things to say about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8, giving us an idea on how to set our minds to be in one place. Romans 8, verse 5, he says, Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. 
Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You see the two minds there, right? There's two minds that Paul presents. The one who sets their mind on the things of the flesh, I will satisfy the appetites of the flesh. I will give zero hesitation and place no barriers between my fleshly impulses and what I eventually do. That's the mindset on the flesh. And the one set on the spirit says, I recognize my flesh wants to pull me all these different ways, but I'm prepared for it. I won't be perfect, but I'm prepared for it. And I'm going to guard against it with my mind. Some people look at mind things and they think, they think it's not practical. It's like this theoretical thing. No, this is practical application. You decide what to think about and where to, and where to uh, direct your thoughts. That is the exercise Paul is telling us to do. It is a verb and a, and a practical thing we do. Set your mind on the spiritual things. Dwell on them. Stick our nose in the Bible and let that guide every thought and every action. And if we don't, the flesh will have its way. Returning to the analogy of the sea. <clears throat> How do you keep a boat fixed in, in one place? You need an anchor. You need an anchor. And the Bible describes what is our anchor. In Hebrews, just a few pages back from James, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17, and 19, 17 through 19, describes an anchor. Hebrews 6, 17. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, that's you and I, that's those of faith, to show to the heirs of promise the unchangeableness of His purpose interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. So he's saying there's two unchangeable, steadfast, constant things. One is God's promise. He who has promised is faithful. that It doesn't change. And number two, He doesn't lie. So by two unchangeable things, it is guaranteed Verse 18 continues, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. Take hold of the hope that is set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil. So the writer of Hebrews here compares anchor to hope. It is our anchor. So in some sense here, the, the double-minded man, the one who doubts, is not anchored by hope. They fail to recognize and center their minds on this hope that is there if they endure patiently until the end. Exactly how James will end this letter in chapter 5. Faith and hope are connected. We understand this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. They're tightly coupled. And again, this is why James had so much to say about faith in chapter 2. One other thing. Impurities of the heart. This is not the last time that James will talk about the double-minded person. If you flip over to chapter 4, he will address the double-minded man again. Look at verse 8. What, what the context here is James has been dealing in chapter 4 with quarrels and conflicts among people. He condemns them for it, and then he starts to give a remedy. He starts to give a remedy for how to guard against these quarrels and conflicts, and that remedy begins about 6, where he introduces the idea of grace, and then 7, you see a bunch of action verbs. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Verse 8, draw near to God. Cleanse your hands, and then you see the one that addresses the double-minded man at the end of verse 8. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's the instruction given specifically to the double-minded person. Purify your hearts. If your heart needs purifying, that means that there are impurities to remove. That's the idea of pure. It is void of impurities. And this follows naturally from what James was talking about at the end of chapter 3. Because if you look at chapter 3, verse 17, he's talking about the wisdom which is from above, is first, notice he, he's going to characterize godly wisdom a bunch of ways, but it is first pure in James 3.17. It is 
first pure, and then all of these other things, peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering and without hypocrisy. But godly wisdom is first pure, meaning it is void of impurities. What impurities? To answer that, consider what wisdom he's contrasting that with. In verse 14, he talked about the wisdom which does not come from above, that which is earthly according to man-made things. It's natural according to the flesh. It's demonic in that it's insubordinate. That's what he's contrasting it with. And notice how what the source of that is in verse 14 of chapter 3. If you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. And then in verse 16, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every vile thing. So the beginning of vile practice, the beginning of every evil thing, basically what characterizes non-godly wisdom at its source is jealousy and self, selfish ambition. Satisfy me. Do what's best for me. Is at the source of the non-godly wisdom. That's the heart impurities that the godly wisdom is first pure of. And so for this double-minded person, James's instruction is purify your hearts. Search for them. Look within yourself and look for instances where I am selfish. Am I really seeking God and others first in this? Or am I satisfying myself? Is the appetite of the flesh dominating? my decision making purify your hearts you double minded so as we close returning to the original question what are these two minds the two minds of the double minded man in the context of James 1 the one mind is commit to the biblical principles that God is instructing us through James for dealing with trials that's the one mind, to commit to that process. And that involves understanding why there is joy to consider in trials. That involves understanding what its end result is. It involves a prayer, a sincere prayer for wisdom for that understanding to be resilient during trials. That's the one mind. And the other one is live like today is it. Why respond patiently if Jesus isn't coming? If there are no eternal consequences, why live patiently? Because all there is is today. I must benefit self. That's what I try to optimize. That's the other mind. One is based on godly wisdom. The other on an earthly wisdom. One puts faith in God and a type of faith that manifests in action. And the other one is an empty faith. Faith in quotations, if it can even be called faith at that point. It does not result in serving others. The point is, these two minds are completely incompatible. You cannot make both work. And that's the idea behind this double. That's why they're unstable. They teeter this way, they teeter that way. You can't make them both work. This person wants to sit on both sides of the fence. Have one foot in the door of the world and have the other foot in the, in the, in, in the door of, of devotion to God. And they can't pull the leg out of the worldly door. An inability to decommit. And this involves a serious soul searching that is our own exercise. No one else can do this for you. It's like the analogy of the mirror that James will give later in chapter one. The mirror is likened, the word of God is likened to a mirror because it reveals a lot of things that we need to change, is what James will talk about in chapter one. And, and no one can identify those things better than yourself. Of course, God knows them. But the, this is talking about internal matters. Remember, God sees as man sees, so he knows. But I can't look at you and your hair color and whatever. Those are external things, right? This is an internal characteristic that we are targeting here. And the results, if we don't fix it, is verse 7. Can't expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's a classic dichotomy, right? God and then everything else. James chapter 4, verse 4, befriend God or befriend the world. Matthew 6, 24, to serve God or serve money. Galatians 1, 10, to please God or to please men. Romans 6, to be alive for God and dead to sin or to present our bodies as instruments for unrighteousness. It suffices to. It suffices to just say to. 
God, and then everything else. So I ask you this morning, are you double-minded? The idea is, have you committed? How committed are you? To the process. It is a process. That's why he says, if you lack wisdom, ask God and pray for it. God, give me this awareness, the awareness that I need. Give me the wisdom and the guidance from your word. Ask him, and he will give it to you. But understand what that means. We can't have a part of our heart in the world. We have to first fully de decommit from that and commit to this process. And it can be yours. And if you're trying to do this without Jesus, you're fighting an uphill battle. Receive the word with humility and plant it in your souls, which is able to save you. Humility comes first. James will talk about that later in chapter 1 as well. If you haven't done that this morning, I encourage you to. Understand who Jesus was. He was the literal Son of God who left heaven. The Word became flesh and light came into the world. And He has made all of this possible for us this morning. Humble your hearts. Do some soul searching. If you haven't been baptized into Christ, commit your life to Him. You can have all of your sins forgiven, every single one you've ever committed, have them washed away in baptism, and then dedicate your life to this process. Let's sing our song.